welcome to CC live lecture series. Uh, as most of you who have been following this lecture series would know that we have been taking up specific texts written by well known scholars and thinkers from different periods of time and from different parts of the world and focusing on the text itself. Uh, the reason one was doing so was that very often while we do look at these thinkers in our syllabus, in our curricula, uh, you know, in our routine examinations, we very rarely, at least in our parts of the world, go back to the original text and find out what did these thinkers actually write in the, the language that they wrote in. What was the context within which they write and why should we study these texts at all? For example, the text that I have identified today is by Karl Marx, Manifesto of the Communist Party. It was written late in 1847, which is a very, very long time ago. 1947, India became independent. We are almost 70 years since then. So it's about 170 years ago that you had this particular text written. The first question that would strike anybody is why should we do a text of this order? And why should we do a text which was written so long ago by a German philosopher in another part of the world, in another period, particularly in 2018, where we have definitely a decline of the left movement, a decline of uh, the kind of focus on Marxist literature that used to be maybe even 25 years ago. So I begin with this first explanation as to why a text of this kind remains pertinent even today. In my last lecture, I had also taken up Karl Marx, German ideology, and we had discussed at some length the theory and method which Karl Marx identified. We had spent some time on what he understood by historical materialism and his critique of idealism. Now, when we look at this manifesto of the Communist Party, you will find a certain uh, you know, manifestation of the broad ideas that we outlined in the earlier lecture. You will also find, for example, that while it is called the manifesto of the Communist Party, and indeed it was the manifesto of the Communist Party written late 1847, a lot of the manifesto is actually examining the nature and spirit of capitalism. What is it which defines a capitalist social system? What is its specificity? What are its tension? What is its mode of production? What is its social relations of production? What are its possible contestations or crisis? In 2018, much that the world has changed, what has not changed is that we continue to remain in a society largely defined by capitalism. So some of the issues that he identifies as descriptive and analyzing about capitalism remains valid today. Now to go back to certain basic facts as who commissioned this text. And uh, interestingly, it was the Communist League. What was the Communist League? An international association of workers, which could only be at that time a secret one. Again, going back to another period of time when communism was suspect, when people were wary about this possibility of a communist revolution, and you would have many state um, you know, heads and state powers which would be trying to identify what is it that the communists were up to? So here, this manifesto was signed at, after the Congress held in London in November 1847 and was sent for publication a detailed theoretical and practical problem for the party, program for the party. Here, uh, you may notice that there are two dimensions to the program. One is theoretical, the other is practical. It's the theoretical which becomes critically important for my lecture today. That is the theory articulated in the Communist Manifesto still have some relevance in analyzing the societies in which we live. And I would like to argue it does. And I hopefully would show during the course of my lecture how that would work out. Uh, I have drawn, as in my earlier lectures, direct quotations again to convey 
to all the uh, listeners in different parts of the country who are listening to me a sense of how it was written, what was the text. Of course, the original here, this is a translated version from German, but here this is how it begins. A specter is haunting Europe, the specter of communism. All the powers of all Europe have entered into a holy alliance to exorcise this specter. Pope, the Tsar, Metternich and Guizot, French radicals, German police spies. It's another period. You may ask, what relevance do we have to understand this kind of Europe which was there so many, so many decades ago? It's important to have a historical perspective. As I teach, as I come to the tail end of my teaching career, I feel this even more intensely. I feel it intensely when I hear debates on television in India, a sense of a lack of understanding of history, a lack of comparative perspective. If we do not know the kind of mistakes and developments which happened in history, we are prone to repeat those mistakes. If we do not know the kind of tragedies as well as achievements which took place in history, we would be prone to again fall into the pitfalls of history. A historical context is therefore very, very important, becomes even more important in a time where you have a lot of fake information circulating through the social media. It becomes very important for any sincere and serious academic input to take into this consideration and try and attempt to see how it would be to develop an informed discourse, an informed public discourse, discussion in the world today. Now, where is the party in opposition that has not been decried as communistic by its opponents? Here Marx is referring to a time when he was writing this, where there was a great hostility to the kind of attempt made by the communists of that period. Importantly, unlike today, at that point communism was in ascendancy. Here again, it's important to understand how historically to events do change, ideological orientations change. If we do not understand these historical processes, we would be confined to saying yes or no, agree or disagree, instead of going into any kind of nuance and informed understanding, which is the demand of the day. Two things that result from the fact the fact that everybody didn't like communism at the time, that at that point of time it was already acknowledged by all European powers to be of certain consequence. And second, the point that Marx is saying that if everybody is taking communism seriously, for the communists it was important to publish their views openly. There was no subterfuge, there was no double-faced nature about the program. They expressed it honestly as it was, there was no hidden agenda, it was explicitly stated. So you had at that point of time, and you must recall, at that point along with the rise of the communist movement, you had a tendency for an international approach to social issues. So here it was the Communist Manifesto being translated in English, French, German, Italian, Flemish, Danish. Interestingly, in our part of the world too, it was translated into the Indian languages. I now return again to the actual text as it was. And it begins with the bourgeois and the proletariat. Now, when we use the word bourgeois and the proletariat, most people have heard these words. Most people have some understanding and some idea of what they feel Marx, Marxism and Communist Manifesto was about. So you often have a, like in a childish imagination of these two groups, the bourgeois and the proletariat, facing each other like we see in old films two warring groups facing each other in war. The story, however, as articulated in the manifesto is little more complex. Now, when I read out this line, the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggle. Here, again, when you say class struggle, the assumption here is that there are two different classes, we are fighting each other. The story, again, is a little more complicated than that. It is true that there would be a conflict between freemen and slave, patrician and plebeian, lord and serf, about the oppressor and the oppressed. But the conflict is not just about groups of 
people. The conflict is also about ideas, contending ideas, contending philosophies and also a conflict between new ideas, new developments in technology and production and old social organization. I shall develop this point a little further on. Now, what we are trying to uh, look at here in the PPT that is there before you is to show that how did this new bourgeoisie or the new middle class or how did the new ruling sections of capitalism emerge? And here it's important to go back to the basic principles of Marxism arguing that the new emerges from the old. So he says, from the serfs of the middle age sprang the char chartered burghers of the earliest times. From these burghers, the first elements of the bourgeoisie were developed. So the feudal system of industry was the, in the system from within which capitalism emerged. And here again, as I go into the next couple of sections, you would notice that what is happening here is that Marx is applying his theory, his historical knowledge and his method of understanding how societies change. So he is arguing the feudal system of industry in which industrial production was monopolized by closed guilds now no longer suffice for the growing wants of the new markets. Now, I spent a little bit of time by what does he mean by it. Now, during feudalism too, even in our own country, in India, during feudal regimes, you would have various kinds of production. As we know, the wonderful saris, the wonderful weaving industry, uh, the wonderful brass works. India has been uh, you know, a site for these incredible uh, products which have been produced. But in the feudal period, they were produced very often in limited scale, limited scale, not industrial production and very often under state patronage, maybe by the king, maybe by the Nawab and it was limited scale and it was not enough to grow to the caterers and demands of the new market. The manufacturing system that took place could not continue within the older system of the feudal system of industry, of guild man, uh, masters, of limited division of labor. Modern industry, the markets kept ever growing. Now look at this text that is there for you to look at in the PPT very carefully because here Marx is capturing the kind of dynamism which defined modern industry. The markets kept ever growing, the demand ever rising, even manufacturers no longer sufficed. Thereupon steam and machinery revolutionized industrial production. Now you may ask, okay, all of this was happening way far away in Europe. What connection does it have with, to do with India? Now importantly, you must realize that this very modern industry, this very large growing markets, this very growth of capitalism transformed India. The kind of manufacture that was taking place in Europe, in Britain in particular, impacted us. How did it impact us? I am sure in your history textbooks you would have written about how when British colonialism came to India, they destroyed our traditional textile industry. They destroyed our artisanal production, cheap products from cotton industries, manufactured industries, large scale production came and flooded our markets. They destroyed the smaller scale handmade production which was on in our countries. So this story when we say that look is it worth looking at communist manifesto, it's so old, what relevance does it have today? We don't even have communism functioning the way it used to do, why are we doing it? We are doing it because this text is not just a communist manifesto, it's one of the finest critique and analysis of capitalism which persists today. It gives us a certain inkling about what happened to us when manufacturing, when capitalism inherently became global. Now you have the section where he talks about the modern industry and the world market. Modern industry has established the world market for which the discovery of America paved the way. This market has given an immense development to commerce, to navigation, 
to communication by land. And you may ask, but what does that have to do with us? The discovery of America and here we are in India. Now, on a sort of lighter note, you're all familiar uh, about how Columbus mistook America to be Indian and therefore named the indigenous, the first uh, nation in the United States of America as Indian. But apart from the fact, what transformed and what Marx was indicating was that this new form of large-scale development gave an immense development to commerce, to navigation, to communication by land. The fact that very soon you had a situation where you had Vasco de Gama landing in Kerala, you had the Dutch coming, you had the French coming, shortly after you had the British coming, you had the Danes at some point of time coming right here in India as we talk here today. The development has in its turn reacted on the extension of industry and in proportion as industry, commerce, navigation, railways extended in the same proportion, the bourgeoisie developed, increased its capital and pushed into the background every class handed down from the Middle Ages. So what happened to the serfs? What happened to the feudal lords? Everything changed. In the West, where capitalists grew, capitalism grew in its full-throated form, you may have had a situation where feudalism was actually overthrown. What happened in colonial countries like ours, you had a strategic understanding between the growth of capitalism and existing feudal rule. So you had a situation where you had uh, the zamindari system being buttressed by the colonial rule and you had a certain emissarization of the peasantry, a certain deal which the British took over new land relations, new cash crops, new kind of products, new taxation policy, new revenue structure, which transformed not just the macro perspective, but even the micro, even the details. If you read novels about the indigo cultivation, about the opium trade, about the indentors labor, you will realize the story that Marx is talking about in Communist Manifesto is not some distant, remote, irrelevant story, but a story which impinged upon our lives as we speak here today. Now, I, I sort of, you know, want to draw attention to one fact, the fact that uh, repeatedly you use classes, repeatedly use the word bourgeoisie, repeatedly use the word revolution, modes of production and exchange. Now, the point that I mentioned just a few minutes ago is very often when we talk about class struggle, you assume that there are these two contending classes or groups, homogeneous, confronting each other. When you say revolution, you assume that it is a revolution of one group of people against the other. That is true. But there is a more theoretical point which underpins the conflict that he tries to articulate. That is the revolution in the modes of production and exchange. What do we mean by that? That the manner in which we produce and the manner in which we exchange gets transformed. As you are familiar, at one point it would be barter exchange and another point it was mediated by some other kind of symbol or currency. Then you have a kind of money exchange. You have new re series of revolution which transforms the technology we use and the manner in which we organize our production. This is something we have to keep in mind as we try to understand what is it that he means by modes of production and exchange. For a minute, we perhaps can go back to the point that he articulated in German ideology, a point that I discussed at some length in the earlier lecture, the emphasis on the material context within which we are located, that each one of us are located in a certain mode of production. We are in a certain mode of exchange. They may appear as abstract terms, but if we explicitly explain it and say it means that we live in a market society, a society of capitalism, where we, for example, have completely 
compete to get certain kinds of job, that you have a certain notion of profitability and a certain notion of whether you are doing the kind of work that you are doing or not. You have differential relations to the mode of production. So, I as a middle class teacher would have a certain relation to the mode of production whereas, maybe a tribal woman working in the forest would have a differential relation to the mode of production. But each of us are defined by it. He continues to argue that each step in the development of the bourgeoisie was accompanied by a corresponding political advance of that class. Here he is making another point that it is not just the mode of production understood in any crude economic sense that along with the economic transformation where the bourgeoisie becomes the dominant class, the bourgeoisie also establishes political control. The bourgeoisie since the establishment of modern industry in the world has taken over the state, the exclusive political sway. The state in a modern society is controlled by the ruling sections of society. Theoretically, a liberal democratic state has to listen to every sections of society, has to listen to the poor, to the rich, to the peasants, to the capitalist. Every year when we have the budget, you would very often hear the finance minister having discussions maybe with big business, maybe with farmers, maybe with traders, maybe with women entrepreneurs. But as all of us, as common sense would dictate to us that the, perhaps the state would listen more to the people who are more dominant than to the people who have very little say in the structure that defines this society. Uh, as a teacher, what I find very interesting is that when I teach or when I give a lecture, I am obviously not giving to a lecture to what we call a tabula rasu that is uh, to a group of people who all are not informed. They already have ideas, they already have certain associations uh, with the concept for example, the bourgeoisie. Now, you have to remember that when Marx used the word bourgeoisie, the bourgeoisie is both an analytical and a, historically descript a historical description. It is not a shorthand for critique or for criticism. And the most amazing part of the Communist Manifesto is that Marx saw the bourgeoisie playing historically a revolutionary role. He saw capitalism as a dynamic social system, that it may be oppressive, deeply unequal, but it had a dynamism which was not historically available in a feudal society. Very often when I teach in class, I give this image of a society of maybe even a film, maybe a film in our part of the world, maybe many of the old uh, Hindi films uh, of the 50s and 60s, where very often you would have uh, the person who came from the village to the city maybe a poor cousin coming to the successful cousin in the city and the person who came from the village uh, would not even know how to move out in the streets. Uh, there was no urgency, there was no hurry, there was nothing to move forward to and even today in large parts of rural India in small towns, you do not see the same kind of rush that you may find in uh, Mumbai or in Calcutta or in Delhi uh, in the big metros or in the railway stations, the rush of people, the urgency to reach somewhere. This is just a visual description, but behind the visual description there are social forces, the forces of production, the forces of reproduction. Now to return to the central point that the bourgeoisie historically has played a most revolutionary role. The bourgeoisie wherever it has got the upper hand has put an end to all feudal, patriarchal, idyllic relations. That there was a time very often even when we discuss the good old days, the good old days when everything was idyllic and Marx says here the bourgeoisie wherever it has got the upper hand has put an end to all feudal, patriarchal, idyllic relations. So, it is not a one sided uh, you know criticism of everything that is feudal. Every system, every society has its oppressive dimensions, its coercive dimensions and it has its own 
cultural ways and practices, the idyllic relations. Now, what has the bourgeoisie done? What has capitalism done? And this is a beautiful, it's almost like literature where Marx writes, it has pitilessly torn asunder the motley feudal ties that bound man to his natural superiors and has left remaining no other nexus between man and man than naked self-interest, than callous cash payment. Read it carefully. It has pitilessly torn asunder the motley feudal ties that bound man to his natural superiors. All of us in India would be familiar with the term of Namak Haram. The idea that when you have been fed by somebody, your natural superiors may be the landlord and you are a serf and they are your natural superiors, you must never betray them. You are subjected to them forever. But this, this relationship, Marx argues, has been broken, pitilessly torn asunder. It has left remaining no other nexus between man and man than naked self-interest than callous cash payment. And even today, in early 21st century, we often talk about the idyllic time where it was not money that ruled. It was not money that decided, not callous cash payment. And here again, it's a wonderful description of what happens. So apart from the idyllic relationships being finished, he, uh, you know, and I've sort of head, uh, taken from the text to give the heading, the icy water of egotistical calculation. But the bourgeoisie has revolutionized everything. It has drowned the most heavenly ecstasies of religious fervor, of chivalrous enthusiasm, of philistine sentimentalism in the icy water of egotistical calculations. People are calculating, should I do this? Should I do not? Should I share the fact that a job has been advertised or should I keep quiet in case my friend applies for it and my chances are lost? Uh, should I, uh, you know, talk about sentimental virtues of doing something for somebody else or should I calculate? Does chivalry matter where it's a sacrifice matter where any of this matter or should it only be the icy water of egotistical calculation written more than 150 years ago but rings the truth rings the truth and that's the point where I began with that this text is an extraordinary uh, pithy and analytical um, you know, understanding of the nature of capitalism. It has resolved personal worth into exchange value and in place of the numberless indefensible chartered freedoms has set up that single unconscionable freedom, free trade. This is a loaded text, a very, very loaded text. Very often we talk about freedom. We talk about freedom as something which is about expressing oneself, expressing our inner selves, the freedom to write, the freedom to sing, the freedom to paint, the freedom to dance. But he says all these other freedoms have now been subjected to the ultimate freedom, the idea of free trade. In one word, one exploitation veiled by religious and political illusions, it has substituted naked, shameless, direct brutal exploitation. Here he says that in feudalism you often did not see the brutality of oppression. It was covered by a whole set of cultural apparatus which made it easier for you to accept. But today in a capitalist society everything is naked, shameless, direct. Nothing is, you don't beat about the bush. You are brutal. Many of us of my generation are struck by the younger generation who are blunt about what they want, who are blunt about their aspirations. Recall in my discussion on German ideology, the kind of society that we are in is what we are. What we do is what we are. Our expressions are not just defined by the ideas that we have, but by the material conditions within which we are located. Now, I continue with the historical role of the bourgeoisie, as has been mentioned in both my PPT and in my presentation, that this had a revolutionary role. And Marx continues to argue, 
It has drowned the most heavenly ecstasies of religious fervor, of chivalrous enthusiasm, of Philistine sentimentalism in the icy water of egotistical calculation. I have already talked about the rise of the free trade, about the naked uh, question of exploitation. He goes on to describe what has happened, stripped of its hallow, occupations and institution. The bourgeoisie has stripped the hallow of every occupation hitherto honoured and looked up with reverent awe. It has converted the physician, the lawyer, the priest, the poet, the man of science into its paid wage labourers. Very often, as we live in the 21st century in India, we talk about the medical profession, we talk about the legal profession. And what is the first thing that we talk about when you talk about health issues or hospitals or doctors or lawyer? What we talk about is, oh my God, the amount of money that we may have to spend. It is crude, calculated, direct question of commerce. No, it is no longer hallowed, it is no longer revered, it is no longer honoured. As I draw towards the tail end of my teaching profession, very often I feel that like the teaching profession has now been reduced to service providers. The idea that you pay such heavy fees to go into a private university or into a coaching institute. You have to deliver. Where are your deliverables? Where are your deliverables if you haven't had that many of your students qualify for an entrance exam or break through certain kind of entrance, entrance exam for a job. Where are the deliverables? But in traditionally, the idea of the teacher was to teach. There was a certain normative or moral dimension of what you were doing. The idea of building up good citizenship, the idea of equipping people with analytical devices. Where would that go? when we take over the whole question of teaching profession as a direct commercial imperative. He goes on further to argue, it is not just occupations, it is not just institution. The bourgeoisie has torn away from the family its sentimental veil. It has reduced the family relation to a mere money relationship. In our parts of the world, where very often we eulogize the family. We were reluctant to even critique the family, though there would be oppressive dimensions just as there would be wonderful dimensions to a family. But today very often you come across uh, newspaper articles where you have uh, uh, the father demanding the right uh, you know, to continue living in the house that he owns, a son protesting against the parents. You have the family relation to a mere money relation. You have questions of maybe decision before your marriage to have what kind of division of property or money would take place if there is a divorce. You would have children demanding of their parents what they could expect from them in money terms. So the bourgeoisie has torn away from the family its sentimental value and reduced the family relation to a mere money relation. It doesn't mean that there was no um, you know, aspect of commerce in an earlier period. The question was in an earlier period there was a veil, there was a cover, whereas in the current period everything is exposed. You can see it for what it is. Constant revolutionizing the re re relations of production. Here, uh, this aspect, this part of the Communist Manifesto is very important to understand what is the inner dynamism of capitalism. What is it which makes capitalism grow and grow, expand and expand? The bourgeoisie cannot exist without constantly revolutionizing the instruments of production and thereby the relations of production and with them the whole relation of society. Again, look at this text very, very carefully. That in the logic of capitalism, they have to constantly improvise on technology. Look, this technology is dated. We have to now have a new kind of technology if we have to be efficient. The instruments of production has to change. But along with it, the relations have to also change. 
And once those relations change, the whole relations of society itself can also change. I will give you a small example. All of you are very familiar with what is called Fordism. That is in the 50s and 60s when you had large scale industrial production, you had assembly line production, large factories and a certain kind of order of specialized division of labor. But people started feeling that with Fordism required a certain scale of investment which was not profitable. So not only was new technologies uh, brought in, but you had new organization. For example, you, we shifted from Fordism to flexible labor. So today in our country, for example, or world over, you will rarely come across a factory which is hiring hundreds and thousands and thousands of people, which we once did in our textile industry. If you look at the city of Mumbai, there were so many cotton textile industry all shut. Does it mean that the garment industry has stopped in our country? No, but very often it is flexible. So you may have a middle person, a middleman uh, contracting. Uh, certain kind of maybe products, uh, maybe in a slum, asking women uh, to produce certain things. And at the end of the day, they may be uh, paying them not wages, not regular wages, but piecemeal and then bringing it and then they may get branded and you may actually have a product made by a woman sitting in a slum, which then gets picked up and branded by maybe a multinational or a transnational or you know organization all of you are familiar that some of the biggest brands the production is made maybe in Bangladesh maybe in Sri Lanka maybe in India but the brand would be of a certain um, you know name which would be associated maybe in many cases with the West in some cases with not now he comes to the last part and this is a text which has been uh, cited by many many people Many, many people, including uh, people who later talked about postmodernism not too long ago, that look what capitalism does to us is that all relations change, all fixed, fast, frozen relations with a train of ancient and venerable prejudices and opinions are swept away. All newly formed ones become antiquated before they can ossify. Here, he, what Marx is doing is capturing the unending dynamism of capitalism. Nothing stays constant. It's not forever the same. Not forever the ancient village system of India where things stayed roughly the same. Houses stayed roughly that they were. Food was eaten roughly the way it was by your grandfather, your great grandfather, your great grandmother, your mother. Uh, there was a certain slowness, sometimes unmoving, whereas with the coming of capitalism, all the fixed, fast, frozen relationship with the train of ancient and venerable prejudices and opinions are swept away. All new formed one becomes antiquated before they can ossify. To grasp the context within which Marx was speaking, you must realize that he was writing at the time when Europe was undergoing the kind of transformations that he's talking about, that everything that was sacred is done for, nothing is revered. Everything is now direct, brutal and commercial. All that is solid melts into air. All that is holy is profaned and man is at last compelled to face with sober senses his real condition of life, his relation with his kind. Everything that is solid has melted into the air. We are suddenly all that we thought was sacred, all that we thought was holy is profaned. And man is at last compelled to face with sober senses his real condition of life and his relations with his kind. Here, maybe to explain exactly what is it that he's trying to argue, is that in an earlier period of time, say in a feudal regime, you may be a bonded labor. And you have the landlord and you are bonded for life. Not only are you bonded for your life, so will your ancestors and so will your children be to the landlord. But this relationship was never posed or seen as exploitative, nor was it seen as brutal. It was seen as natural, solid, even holy, sacred. For after all, you are not supposed to stab the person who fed you. But now that that holy world is 
done for. You can see the exploitative relationship for what it is. Just like you, as a wage labor, are no longer compelled to work for the factory worker that you dislike, the factory owner is also not compelled to keep you as somebody who is bonded to the factory worker or to the family of the factory worker for life. Everything now is contractual. It is done for. It's something which is direct. Now, uh, we spent a little bit of time on talking about the inner dynamism of capitalism. There is another aspect to this and this aspect is the whole issue of global markets. And here is interesting because uh, your generation, the younger generation are all very familiar with globalization and global markets. But the globalization actually began with the very beginning of capitalism. Capitalism was essentially a global phenomena unlike say feudal regimes which were more specific to the regions within which they were. You did have a feudal global market but you do have a capitalist global market. The need of a constantly expanding market for its product chases the bourgeoisie over the entire surface of the globe. It must nestle everywhere, settle everywhere, establish connections everywhere. Again notice the almost the literary style of the language. Again, sort of uh, try and s imagine uh, what is it this aspect of this constant expansion for market. You would see if you have you are in business yourself or you know people in business or you know people who work maybe for a transnational corporation or a big company, they would be constantly say we are now going to expand to Africa, we are going to invest in Latin America, we are now exploring new markets in Southeast Asia. And here you want to go in every kind of place which is possible because if you don't, if you don't expand, if you don't settle everywhere, if you don't establish connections everywhere, you will lose and losses are not accepted within the capitalism. So there is a cosmopolitan character to this production and consumption. There is a certain question of transnationality. As we come to the end of uh, this session, I just want uh, to again identify some of the older issues which are there in uh, you know uh, the manner in which capitalism has been defined in transnational capitalism or in the communist manifesto. Now I sort of return to the text here. Now it has drawn from under the feet of industry the national ground on which it stood. All old established national industries have been destroyed or are being daily being destroyed. Now, along with this global nature of capitalism, there is another aspect that Marx draws to. And again, you will notice how relevant Communist Manifesto is to understand the political economy of contemporary times, the societies that we live in. Universal interdependence of nation. They are dislodged by new industries whose introduction becomes a life and death question for all civilized nation by industries that no longer work upon indigenous raw material. Think about today, 21st century, how often how interconnected we are, how often when you go to a, re a railway station or an airport, you see people traveling not just across the country, across the world. You talk to people about the kind of work they do and you will see that their businesses are very often global, that you have the jewelry industry, the fashion industry, you have even your education industry which is often stretched across the globe. You have publishing industry, you have uh, you know new universities which may be globally uh, you know uh, controlled. You have so a new situation but this new situation may have taken a certain kind of direction in the contemporary period but at the time when Marx was writing it was impacting us directly. Take this example, the raw material drawn from remoter zone, industries or products are consumed not only at home but in every quarter of the globe. One example from India, tea. Tea was not naturally grown in our country. The British came and planted the tea industries in parts of Assam, the northeast and in the south. But the tea was consumed by everybody across the world. So the tea which we didn't drink traditionally now became part of our culture. 
and the people who were laboring the social organization of that production you had labor which was brought in from distant parts established in the plantations you had uh, maybe you know uh, a corporation called a particular by from a british name uh, which was became uh, the label for a tea produced in assam now drunk across the globe it is happening today it was happening even then interestingly for you uh, you would know at the during the british period uh, they in fact introduced something called a plantation time you know that in uh, the in assam where uh, the sun rose much earlier it was important to catch the daylight in the early morning and so it began earlier so how time the clock time was redefined in according to the needs of the production so the complex relationship between the mode of production relations of production and organization is something which is there there's another dimension to the endless quest or dynamism of capitalism and here it is in place of old wants satisfied with the production of the country we want new things all of you are familiar in the contemporary period how there's a dynamism that we want new things when parents argue with their children that why do you want a new mobile or why do you want a new app or a computer when you have the old one the argument would be that it is dated it's done for now that is the logic of this constant endless production in place of the old local and national seclusion now we have a certain inter interconnection as i end again an emphasis that what is there in material will also be there in intellectual production as there would be a, a interconnection where are we in the story and i have made an attempt right through my presentation to argue this is not a story just about karl marx writing a particular text from the communist international it is a text which elucidates or helps us to understand what is happening to us today as we have an endless increase of communication uh, com commodities uh, you know everything being broken down intensifying obstinate hatred of foreigners to capitulate a certain kind of tension which arises as these divisions get broken down it compels all of us it was compelling all our ancestors to adopt to the new mode of production it happened in india as we were colonized it's happening today this collect colossal productive forces we have to recognize and understand to understand what is it which is taking over our lives and here it is a subjection not just of nature of machinery of everything that is there i draw to an end here today thank you